Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Unlocked, where we talk about unlocking the potential of you, the people you work with, and the people you do life with. At the time of this recording, I'm offering all of you, yes, my lovely listeners, a free 15-minute communication coaching call. You come with some kind of communication problem, and I give you a solution. My calendar link is in the show notes, so check that out. Ryan Hawk is pretty awesome. And not only because he came on the show, but because of the things he's done and how he's done them. And I think that's what we can all learn here and gain from this episode. So Ryan is, uh, he, he has a business called The Learning Leader Show, and that's the name of his podcast, where he's recorded about 550-ish episodes on there over the past eight years. Forbes called The Learning Leader Show the most dynamic leadership podcast around. Inc. Magazine said it's one of the five podcasts to make you a smarter leader. And Apple named it one of the all-time best seller in 2020, 2021, and 2022. So check out the podcast. He's had some amazing guests on that show. Check that out. Ryan um, has also written a couple of books. He's working on his third one. His first book, Welcome to Management, How to Grow from Top Performer to Excellent Leader, uh, was named 100 Best Management Audiobooks of All Time. Forbes called it the best leadership book of 2020. And Ryan's second book, The Pursuit of Excellence, which we talk about in the interview just a bit, it sold out of its print version in eight hours. And it was named Instant Amazon Hot New Release. So Ryan has made an impact uh, in many spaces, and he speaks on stages, and he does all types of things. And he's making an impact today on the show. And I'm grateful for that. We talk about his book. We talk about this idea of the pursuit of excellence. We talk about, you know, this idea of don't be a sugar cookie. It's a little teaser for you. Uh, so check that out and how a marathon runner actually, you know, doing a single solitary sport, actually uh, a solo sport includes the recognition of his team says it's actually a team sport it is me running but it is all of us combined and we're going to talk about that as well so stay tuned here we come ryan ryan awesome having you thanks for having me scott appreciate it this is going to be fun and i've got to start out with um, with the name, because I mean, you've got a presence in the space of leadership with the book, the podcast and other things, but the coolness of having the word Hawk as your last name, I mean, it's pretty rad, man. <laughs> well, I've done nothing to deserve that. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. I just try to, uh, do my best to make my family members proud. My grandpa, told my, my grandpa Dean Hawk, I remember my dad's dad told me long ago when my brother and I were, I don't know, middle school football players, you know, your people are going to ask for your autograph, make sure you spell that thing out, be proud of your last name, be proud of what it stands for. Um, and I didn't fully know what he meant uh, at that time. But, you know, I, I grow up to see him and my dad be these selfless, uh, honest, hardworking, gritty people. And, um, I try, try to do the same. So it's, yes, I guess, um, it sounds cool. It helps if you have a two syllable first name, one syllable last name, it kind of goes well together, but, um, I'm just trying to really live out the values of my grandpa and my dad. That's cool. That's cool. Represent, um, make them proud, yep. build the legacy or keep the legacy going, yep. you know? So yep. that's awesome. Now what's your, trying to do now you've you've got the learning leader show which is you've had some amazing guests on that show um give me give this a snippet right of what you have gained from doing this show you filmed over you know 500 episodes it's on youtube it's on anywhere you listen to podcasts if you had to kind of glean some gold like what are some different ideas that you've pulled out of these amazing leaders that you have interviewed and had the chance to talk to that you could pass on to us? Uh, there's a lot there, a couple of books worth, but I think if I had to compress that idea, one of the interesting things that it seems all people who have sustained excellence have in common is the fact that they're a work in progress and they view themselves that way. Um, we're all figuring it out as we go. 
Uh, I've yet to meet the perfect leader. I've yet to meet the person who has it figured out. The ones who claim they do, um, I'm concerned. Uh, don't necessarily believe that. Uh, it is interesting as you learn more and more about your heroes and mentors and people you've looked up to because you've maybe seen them on the TED stage or read their books or whatever it may be. And then you meet them and realize that like everybody else, they're trying to figure it out um, and they're a work in progress and they've never arrived. They're always becoming. So uh, in a way that's inspiring to me because uh, I certainly feel that way. Uh, and so I can relate to those who have achieved a lot, who've made a big impact in the world that they face imposter syndrome. They have fears. They question themselves. Um, they're trying to figure it out. And so, um, I think that's something we can all relate to in, in a way that that's, that's inspiring. You have been on your own leadership journey. You now speak, you got the show, you write, um, you try to influence the space as, as much as you possibly can. And w why, like, how did you even land here? Like why this space for you and what was the, the mission, the goal, the passion that drove you into this space in the first place? Uh, mainly just out of curiosity, I would say. I mean, I finished getting my MBA while working full time. It took me six years. And I wanted to go back to school to continue my education. My company reimbursed the cost of, of getting my MBA. And I thought it was a waste if I wasn't using that educational reimbursement money that uh, LexisNexis, the company I worked for, offered. And um, the, the problem, I guess, with some of the more formal education out there, like an MBA or a PhD is you don't really get much choice. They tell you, if you want to get this certificate, your master's of business administration, that you got to go through these X number of classes with these specific teachers at this time. And, um, some of that was good and useful, but a lot of it was not very fun or useful. And so I thought, is there a better way to earn a leadership PhD than going the formal route? What if I created my own leadership PhD program where I get to choose all of the professors and I get to choose the time and I get to choose what I asked them. And then I could document what I was learning at the same time and, share that with other people and maybe they could learn too. They could learn, get, earn their leadership PhD program through the questions I was asking of these people who have sustained excellence over an extended period of time. And so that's what, that's initially what started it. I didn't ever intend to leave my job or to do this full time or to speak on stages or to write books or any of that. I've stumbled into all of that out of a demand from what the market has said it wants. And so, um, I, I left my career uh, in, in sales and sales leadership from LexisNexis and Elsevier Clinical Solutions, where I worked um, at the end of 2017 because the demand was high enough um, and big enough that it said, hey, there's a lot here. We want more beyond just the podcast, beyond just the learning leader show. So that's uh, there was no plan. There was no goals. There was none of that set. It was really just about following my curiosity and obsessions with great rigor. And, be, and out of that, um, some really cool opportunities have, have, have risen. So I'm, I'm just trying to make the most of those now. Okay. So you're curious, you're like, huh, I wonder if I can go out and build my own. I'm going to go out and start just talking to people. I'm going to start gathering insights from real leaders that are out there doing real stuff and see what I can glean from them. Who are some of the people that you've gone, Hey, you've like tapped on their shoulder, right? And you're like, Hey, by the way, I'm Ryan Hawk two syllable first name, last, you know, one syllable last name. I would love some information, some like guidance, some gold, like from you leader person that I admire, like who are some of those people that you tapped on initially and, and what was the benefit of that relationship? Like people I've had on my show. Yeah. Just the people you've tapped into the people that you were, you know, you, that you used to get, gain this knowledge that you, weren't necessarily getting with the MBA, but then you were like, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of go out and blaze my own trail for this thing. Yeah. I mean, um, Kat Cole, Simon Sinek, General Stanley McChrystal, uh, John Chambers, <laughs> JJ Reddick, um, Liz Weissman. So, I mean, I mean, 550 plus of these people. So like, I, I would say there's just, the list goes on and on. I, it's really 
my guest selection is about people that I'm already deeply curious about. And I am already done 10 to 15 hours worth of research leading up to those conversations. So my podcast is all uh, about me being overly prepared so that when we have a conversation, we can just let it fly. And, um, and, and so there isn't a lot of thinking because all of that's done ahead of time. And, and so to me, I'm, I'm just really seeking to talk to people that have done extraordinary things, but more importantly, they've done it in a way in which I deeply admire. And so I want to learn what they've done, how they've done it, who they've done it with, why they do it, how they continue to go, how they sustain excellence. Like I want to learn directly from the sources that it's happening. And I, there's like, to me, there's no cooler way than to have an hour to an hour and a half long conversation with my heroes and ask them these questions. And then in some cases have them on three, four, five, six, seven, Ryan holiday, eight times, like do that. I think that's, that's been one of the coolest parts is not only do you get to learn from them and share those key learnings with the world, but then also develop genuine real relationships where I see them in person. We go out to dinners, we hang out at events, we do work together in some cases. So that's been an added bonus that I would have never guessed to, to build genuine real relationships with heroes of mine. So for all the people out there that aren't going to go out and launch a show and then try to get all these guests on so that they can learn from them, mentorship, this idea of sh idea and sharing knowledge, knowledge exchange and, and what we're doing here and building those relationships. What would you tell people or encourage people to do who are kind of frozen? They're like, oh, I can't approach Simon Sinek or I can't approach, you know, and we don't all have access to, to certain individuals, but we we want that thing, right? We want that knowledge, that relationship. What was it in you that you're like, that's it. I'm just going, I'm going to make it happen that you would tell other people who are a bit hesitant about doing something like that. What would you, what's the advice you would give them? Why would any, anybody be hesitant? Probably, I'm I'm curious. probably That's a genuine question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I probably based on fear, probably based on fear of what? Uh, fear of rejection, fear of them saying no. Probably, I would maybe guess that they just don't know how. Maybe yes, there's okay. just that idea. We could just sure. throw that out there too. Right? So I think that the latter is 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 useful. If if, if people are feared to be rejected or ignored, just just to kind of let's play it out. You send a cold email to Simon Sinek, and that's the name you mentioned, and he either rejects you or ignores you. You're in the exact same spot you were before. Exact same spot. So what difference does it make? So in that case, I think fear of rejection or being ignored makes no sense to me. Um, so I would say in that case, you have to get over that. The second part, the how, there was a lot to get to there. So if we're going to write a cold email, and let's say that th there isn't a warm introduction to be made, there are some parts of cold email writing because I get so many of them. I understand what works and what doesn't. And I also understand what works because I still send cold emails to get guests. Now, it's a lot different because there's a lot of relationships with people and friends of friends. And uh, certainly all of the PR people involved in the podcasting world are very helpful with book publishers and other things going on. So they, they are quite helpful in making these warm introductions. But if you're writing a cold email, I just say a few things to think about is... Uh, the word I would use more than anything else in your cold email, some people would say short and concise. Maybe that's true. But the word I would use is specificity. The, the worst cold emails are cut and paste. They're generic. They're plain. And it shows the person has done no research on the person they're sending an email to. Those get deleted immediately. So if it's generic and it's not specific, I delete it 100% of the time. Now, if it's specific to something I've done or um, something they admire or something they have a specific question about, the odds of getting it replied to are very high. So it, whether that's Cat Cole or Simon Sinek or James Clear or whoever, specificity really matters, that it shows you've done your work. So instead of saying, I admire the fact that you wrote Atomic Habits and it sold 10 million copies, and it's awesome, and it changed my life. Like That's all generic. There's nothing specific there. Versus you have something specific that you learned from James Clear's writing, and you tell him that, and then you say, 
in addition to that, I have this question and you, and you actually write the question. And then the question after that is, you know, we come on my podcast or whatever. James is a tough example because he's getting more and more picky with that stuff. But, but the word is specificity. So that's all I'd say is don't send generic copy and paste cold emails. Tell them specifically why you admire them and specifically why you want to talk to them. And I think that will increase your odds a lot versus what most people do, which is just are they're very general and very vague. And that doesn't seem to work that well in my experience. So I'll, I'll, I'll bend this a little bit. So I, we're specifically talking about reaching out to somebody to be on a show or whatever, but we could totally cater this to anybody that is looking for outside mentorship from somebody they really admire Absolutely. and, uh, and gaining that, that inside edge and trying to build that influence in some way, shape or form that you can understand that, Hey, I am genuinely interested. I've done my research and I'm reaching out to you for a chat. And, uh, I think that what I have found is that more people than not are willing to give the for healthy sure. leaders and the healthy influencers out there in the world are despite us going, Oh gosh, they're probably just way too busy for me. I'm not, I'm not going to bother them. I don't want to bother them. You know, there, there are a lot of individuals out there that we think are, nah, 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 but their, their mission is to give. Yeah. And I, I've found that to be uh, more and more true. Yeah. And if you ask in, it doesn't work. I mean, again, you're in the exact same spot as you were before. So I, I think you, you, you gotta, we have to get over ourselves when it comes to being fearful to ask. We just, just, you gotta ask. I mean, there's a great Steve jobs video about how he cold called, um, Hewlett Packard when he was uh, 12 years old, right? He asked for some spare fre frequency parts. He called him on the phone and not only did he get the spare parts, but he also got uh, a job. And so it's like you, you got the difference between people who make it happen and those who don't is you, you got to be willing to fail. You got to be willing to get rejected. You got to be willing to get ignored. You got to ask, you got to go for it. And I think if you, if that just becomes part of your default setting, the chances of things going well for you dramatically increase than those who are afraid of a rejection or afraid of being ignored. Let's talk about the pursuit of excellence. Let's talk about this book, um, that you've written and it has this idea throughout. And I want to know why, why you wrote this one in the sea of leadership books that are out in the world. Um, some of the, you know, these people that have written these monumental books have been on your show and you're like, you know what? I'm jumping in on this. I'm going to write a book too. Now you have one in 2020. This latest one was 2022 that you released this one. Um, still very relevant for all, everything that we're doing today. Why, why'd you write it? What, what's the essence of it? Uh, I mean, th I think writing is the ultimate clarity uh, of thought tool. And so um, signing up for a big book project first is, is I did it first and foremost for myself um, to learn, to get more clear on what I believe and what I think. And so you, you write a book proposal um, and there's only a few sample chapters in there. It's, it's basically a marketing plan. And then the publisher gives you a book advance. And then it, and once you sign that contract, they say, okay, now you got to go write the additional 60,000 words to finish this thing. Well, that is, that is a, uh, uh, I think one of the most challenging things that I have done in my life, um, now twice and three times. And, and the third one won't be out till next year, but the, the whole process of writing is just the ultimate tool for clarity. And so in a way it's a selfish act to try to better myself. Now, my hope is that people read it and find it useful that I am sharing key things that I've learned throughout the course of the experiences of my own life, as well as those that I've interviewed and, and met with. So I, I would say all, all the books that I write, first and, first and foremost, they'll always first be um, because I think it's an amazing challenge. And I think it's worth it for all of us as leaders to sign up and commit to things that are going to push our edges that are very tough, that are very hard because you keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And then what, what used to be uncomfortable becomes a little bit more comfortable. So it's a, it's, it's really about that first and foremost. And then hopefully, you know, the ideas shared and the story shared within the book could help readers, uh, like 
both value and pursue excellence in their own life. And that's really the gist of, of that one. Okay. What are the commonalities of leaders that are able to sustain the idea of high level leadership and that pursuit of excellence idea? What, what's, what do you think is a common, common leadership trait or character trait or personality? Like, what is that thing? Um, okay. There's, uh, I think an element of, uh, so Kat Cole gave me this great formula that I've since used a lot and, um, expanded on, but on one side, they have this deep level of confidence that has been created by evidence that they can do hard things and they can accomplish things. So confidence and courage, like courage to stand up for what they believe in courage to do the work and live up to their values when it's really hard, right? That's one side. And the other side that's got to be equally balanced is this deep level of curiosity to ask questions, to seek, to understand, to find other people fascinating and be more interested than you are interesting, right? So curious people. They also have a big level of humility, right? So you got courage and confidence on one side, you got curiosity and humility on the other side. And these humble people realize that while they do have uh, a lot of courage, they're very confident, but they're also super curious and they, and they realize that most of us are better in a team setting. Most of us realize that we don't have it all figured out. Most of us need other people. We need help. I know I certainly do. And so that, that, that is a compression of a lot of things. Uh, when Cat Cole said courage and confidence mixed with curiosity and humility, I think productive achievers, people who sustain excellence, they have, the, they have those things really dialed in and they're equally balanced. That's good. That's good. I, and I love the, the combination of, I love that idea of confidence through evidence. Yes. And we don't get the evidence unless we conduct the experiment. Right. And I think that's what kind of what you said earlier on is we don't make the move. We're just in the same spot that we were before. And that's yeah, probably I mean, inside the comfort zone. I, I, I'm a firm believer of confidence is that like whenever you were faced with something hard, for example, like you mentioned books, right? Those are opportunities to create evidence for myself. So I think always seeking out opportunities to create evidence for yourself is how you build confidence. It's how you feel much better about whatever the thing is you want to do. I mean, my background's in sports. And so uh, I, pl I played as a freshman on our on our varsity team, and and I learned so much more by being put out on the field under the bright lights with guys four years older than me than anything else I could have done. And when it when I like when I did well and executed the offense the way it was supposed to be executed and helped our team win, I mean I was flying high, I was sky high because I had created evidence for myself, and then it built and it built and it built created momentum and i think that's what we want to do and whatever it is that we're trying to do if you want to stand up on stages and speak or you want to do a podcast write books like the best way to get good at it is to get reps is to do it so i think of this all hard things are opportunities to create evidence for yourself and so that's why we should regularly be looking and seeking out opportunities to do hard things by doing that we'll feel better and better each time even if the hard thing you're doing isn't related to the other hard thing, they're both hard. And so that gives you a chance to say like, to transfer that confidence from one area to another. And that's just like a, a, a way of life. So I try to do that. I fail at times, but I think that's uh, useful. At least it has been in, in, in my career. Yes. How about, let's flip it a little bit though. And let's say, sure, we need to push ourselves to do things that are going to help create evidence for us confirm that because then, then we gain, we gain that momentum. We start going, okay, this, this is safer because our brains are going to protect us from doing anything too crazy. Right. And, and the, for the idea of survival, we're going to take that step forward, step forward, step forward. How do we help other people? Like if we get it. We're like, Hey, I get it. I know I need to push myself and I do. And I, you know, so, so I can do those things, but I have this person on my team that just won't, that just, how do I help them create situations, opportunities where they can build confidence, where they can take that step so that they can get evidence of the thing that they're doing, that they are going to be more you know, confident in that competence that they have or incompetence that they are trying to grow. 
uh, I mean, listen to this podcast. It sounds like it would be a good thing for them, for that person. Um, I, I, I mean, provide them with resources that that show them that the only real way to do it, to gain that confidence, is is to take action. We learn who we are in practice, not in theory. It comes from Herminia Abara, meaning you you can sit in the corner and read and take notes all you want. It doesn't really mean anything to me unless you put it into action. And so it's it's that's when the real learning happens. I mentioned playing football, right? I learn the most when I'm on the field under the bright lights with 11 other guys trying to kill me. Like that's when I learn the most. So when you have somebody else, it's like if let's say, okay, like, hey, I'm too nervous to run the next team meeting or no, I don't want to speak up. I just want to do this. Well, if if we deem and we agree that it's necessary for them to develop those skills, well, then we got to give them some, we got to nudge them. We got to put them in those opportunities. We got to give them a chance to perform. And even if it doesn't go well, they, they got to feel good about the fact that they were in the arena, like they were like doing the work. And then we have an after action review. We talk it through. We figure out what went well, what didn't, what they could improve on for the next time. So the, the best way to get good at anything is to, 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 to actually do it. And then you as the leader is there to help them, is there to support them, is there to provide them with feedback, is there to highlight the things that they did do well, as well as to help them with the areas where they struggled so that that the next time they're a little bit better and the next time they're a little bit better. And then they start feeling it themselves. Oh yeah. This whole doing thing is useful. <laughs> so let's keep, let's keep doing it. So they, they, they have to learn though themselves. And I think us as leaders, we just got to put them in the position to create the environment for that learning to happen. Mm, create the environment. I love it. So I hear you talking, support them, give them support. I'm here for you. Here are the resources. Here are the things I, I, I would like for you to do. But then I'm also, I'm not just going to be your cheerleader on the side. I am going to push you. I am going to challenge yep. you to do things out of your comfort zone. You may not like me during the time. You may curse my name when it's happening, <laughs> but you know, because I'm for you and that I provide you some backing that I'm doing it because I want you to be better. And I'm pushing you to take what I like to call massive action, not passive action, where, where you said it was like, hey, the research, it's the reading the book, it's the whatever. But at some point, we got to jump in. We can't just study the playbook all day. We actually got to run the plays and understand what works and what what is happening. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. 100 percent agree. I, I think you, you, as as leaders, too, like like you said, we, we got to be there to support them. But part of being a good leader, too, is is putting your people in challenging positions um, so that they can thrive, they can flourish and, and they're not going to flourish, like just sitting in the corner, reading books all day. That that's not, that's not part of taking massive action as you'd say. Good. Tell me about this. <laughs> Don't be a sugar cookie. Tell me, tell me about that from, from the book. It was, uh, this, this section in your book. And I was reading through some of the topics and some of the ideas in the book and I ran across that and I said, that's, that's interesting. Kind of want to yeah. ask you about that. I mean, General Stanley McChrystal is a huge mentor for me. This is a part of his life when he was going through Navy SEAL training. Um, part of what I've, I've never done any of that. So I hold those guys in the highest regard, but part, part of the training is when they uh, are wearing their full uniforms and make them uh, run out into the ocean and then roll around on the sand. So you're wet and you got sand all over you look like a sugar cookie. Basically um, the instructor could tell general McChrystal who wasn't a general at that time um, to go uh, do that, to hit it at, at any time. Um, there was no rhyme or reason necessarily. It wasn't fair. Um, it didn't really matter. And so the, the sugar cookie story basically to me, and I, I maybe use this as a dad too much, but is, is really about the fact that if you think everything's going to be fair, it's just stupid. Like it's a waste of time to think everything should or is going to be fair. It's just not. I'm at my daughter's volleyball game the other night. The referee obviously missed a call and then missed another call. Blatant missed. I'm not saying they did it intentionally, but you know, it happens. And, you know, the girls are like, it's not, that's not fair. It's not, I mean, that's a great lesson. Of course, it's, it doesn't seem fair that they just missed an entire point, right? Or they, they gave it to the wrong team, whatever. That's life though. Like that's going to happen throughout life is that it does, it's not going to seem fair. It won't be fair, 
but you got to go like you got to respond you got to keep going you got to keep at it if you just wallow around that you're a sugar cookie or that why is he making me run in the ocean and then roll around on the sand this isn't fair this isn't right if you sit around as a victim all the time it's not going to go well for you if you get mad when you send a cold email and they reject you or they ignore you oh my god how could they do that i mean move on go to the next one no means not yet like just keep going and so i i, I view the sugar cookie story as like yeah, of course things are going to happen that aren't fair, that aren't just, that don't make any sense. I don't understand why it happened. I got to keep going. I got to keep going. As Mayor Eric Adams told me when he's on my show, I'm not, I'm not going to beat you with brilliance. I'm going to I'm going to win with endurance. I view that I, I view life that way very much. Like I am not going to be the most brilliant person you have on this podcast, but I'm going to keep going with whatever endeavors I commit to, whether it's writing or podcasting or or getting up and speaking on a stage. I'm not going to win with being the most brilliant or most intelligent person, but I'm willing to endure. I'm willing to keep going. And I think regardless of what things happen that are not fair or don't seem just, we got to just keep going. We got to keep going. We, we can't let that stop us and whine and complain and talk to all of our friends and negatively gossip. Like, what does that do for you? It doesn't do anything of value in my opinion. So the sugar cookie story is just about regardless of what you think is fair or not, you just got to keep going. Speaking of endurance, you also reference a marathon runner who talks about marathon running. So I, I do solo sports as well as team sports, um, but solo sports and treating that like a team effort. So can you tell me about that mentality of a marathon runner who is thinking about marathon running as a team effort, as a team sport, as something that is bigger than just him. Yeah, I'm Kip, Kipchoge is one of the greatest marathon runners of all time. Uh, I, he did run an experiment where uh, he finished the marathon. It wasn't sanctioned, though, in under two hours. Um, but his, his he's all about his team. Uh, I mean, it, the training is, is a part of a team. When he runs the race, there's there's a team element to it. Um, where I, I think it's even in an individual sport like running, um, it, it shows that most of us are better when we're with other people, when we're a part of a group. Even if you're introverted and you get energy from being by yourself and being quiet, whatever it may be, I found that most of us, and I come from team sports background, so I know this to be true, even as the quarterback, you get all of the um, they put they put all your stuff on the highlight reel or they put all your stuff when you throw interceptions like uh, the highlight reel for other teams. You get a lot of the credit and a lot of the blame. But for the most part, um, none of the stuff you accomplish as a quarterback um, is possible if your offensive line doesn't block, if your running backs don't uh, pick up blitzers, if your receivers don't catch and run with the ball. So regardless of, of all of that, like we need other people. And so even Iliad Kipchoge, the greatest marathoner of all time, as stated, his training is all about the team. Uh, when he runs, it's all about the group of people that he's with. Like they push each other, they they're there for one another, they support each other, right? They have the camaraderie in between all of the running that is, I think, very important w amongst teams to build trust, to have laughter, to share meals, to endure together, to do hard things together, to learn together. All of that, uh, I think, gives us a chance to perform at a higher level than if we just did it by ourselves. That sounds like confidence. That sounds like courage. That sounds like curiosity and humility. When somebody can take that, be who they are, but also take the, the, the idea of like, this is everybody else too. Like, there's no way I would be here without all these people. And I think that a lot of us experience the leaders that do think it's all about them versus the leaders that know it's not just about them, that it is about everybody else that's surrounding them uh, that has contributed to them getting to where they are at that. Yeah. Point I mean, when you see the, the, the list of like self-made millionaire, self-made billionaire, it just doesn't, I get why those are the headlines because it looks good and gets clicks, but like it, it, I've just never met a person that's self-made um, everybody's community made. We're all made by the people in, uh, around us um, regardless of your upbringing. Like we're, 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 none of us are self-made. Just it just it's just it's just not true. I mean, we're we're made based on our communities. Of course, we have agency and we work hard and we make good choices and we do what we got to do. That you're still not self-made. Like you're you're made 
by by people within your community, those people that you surround yourself with. So that's why it's so important to be intentional about who you're choosing to surround yourself with, because that's what you're going to become. And um, to me, uh, yeah, I, I, if somebody claims like I'm self-made, I made all this happen, like I, no doubt they may have worked hard and gotten a little lucky and things went well, but they're still community made. And I think that's a good way for us to, to view it is, is it's, it's not really about like all about me. It's about the people that I'm trying to impact and influence as well as the people I'm surrounding myself with that hopefully we can all lift each other up and the stories you're bringing up like Kipchoge and others, that's, that's what they do. And you have been a good example of trying to surround yourself with people that could also help you. Um, yes, you have built your show. Yes, you've written your book. Yes, you speak on stages. Yes, you've influenced the people that you've influenced, but you haven't done it alone. You've you've went out and searched for and got people to pour back into you and to take that and then pour back into everybody else. And, and creating that platform as a model, I think is really, really smart. I think that we can all learn from that. So I appreciate you setting that example for us all. And what I'll say though, is that my, my audience, they, they need to pay attention to what you're saying here. And then I would also tell them to reach back out to you, to your show, to the books, to all those other as assets you've provided, because there is some gold there. You've, you've got some beautiful guests on your show, um, that people can really get a lot of information out of. So tell us how we do that. Where do we find you? What what do we what do we look for? And what would you encourage us to dive into first? Um, so my podcast is called the Learning Leader Show. So anywhere podcasts are found, uh, it's on YouTube as well. And um, the home base for everything that I do is at learningleader.com. So uh, you could you could really get a good sense for everything I write as well as all of the podcast stuff at learningleader.com learning leader. I love that because there's a lot of people that are just like, I'm a leader leader. And it's just like, no, 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 no. We're always learning. If you're not learning, then you're not moving. And, uh, I think it goes back to the humility piece. And I love that. I love the idea of what you're doing. So thanks Ryan for being on the show and, uh, good luck out there, man. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate you having me, man. We are all just a work in progress. All of us. And that initial insight that Ryan shared about the leaders that he has kind of gravitated towards and asked for advice and asked for mentorship and asked for, you know, learnings have all kind of exemplified this idea that we're all just a work in progress. We're all learning to be leaders in our lives and our families at, our, at work and our communities, wherever we are, we're just learning to do that thing. I love this idea if, if all of you, and this is something actionable you can all take right now, is is there somebody out there that you feel is out of reach? Somebody that you feel you would love to tap into, love to get mentored by, love some advice from, and you're hesitant for whatever reason? Do a little research and write that email and reach out and see if there's just, I've been surprised by the people on my show that have actually said yes. And I'm like, oh, wow, really? Okay, that's cool. And so I have, I have tried it myself and it has worked. So I am a uh, witness to what Ryan was talking about there. Um, confidence, courage, and on the other side, curiosity, humility, and balancing those things out and helping us build more confidence and courage through action. And I think that's one theme that I got from this whole interview is the action. We've got to take action. We've got to seek opportunities to create more confidence or else we just kind of stay in this realm of maybe insecurity or, or whatever we're feeling at the time. We need to learn through action. I'm grateful for that advice take action. I'm very into this. Inspiration's great. We all want transformation, but we're not going to get transformation from just inspiration. We've got to have some application. 
We've got to apply the things that we learn. We got to take action in order to experience the transformation we all seek. If you want to find out more information about me or check out the show notes where there's going to be more information and links to the things referenced in this episode, visit scottwaldron.com. And lastly, I'm asking for a little bit of love, just a little bit. So please take a moment, follow, rate the show. The algorithms like that. It helps me get the word out. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And until next time, stay unlocked.